Hello. Of course, our exhibition is called Bible Alive, and um, so we're going to talk now for a few moments about the scriptures. First of all, how we got the, the scriptures, how we got them in English, and then um, we're going to look at some curious Bibles that uh, are collected, and uh, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life with the Bible. First of all, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul writes to his son in the faith, Timothy, these words. All scripture is God-breathed or inspired and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, as we look along here, we see various Bibles. And I used to think, well, you know, just how did we get the Bible? Um, can we rely on what the Bible tells us? Well, I've since been able to uh, purchase a Hebrew scroll, a Torah scroll, the first five books of the Bible. We have it on, on show here. We have it in a special, on a special stand there uh, to uh, give the idea of uh, the ark in the synagogue and um, we've, we've opened the, the scroll there. And of course we know that the uh, first Bible that we have, which we still have today, uh, was in Hebrew and written uh, under the direction of Moses and um, we have that there, and you can still read that scroll uh, today. Of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in, starting in 1946, uh, 47, uh, and um, uh, they proved invaluable in uh, looking at the beginnings of God's Word. They're over a thousand years older than the, the previously oldest Bibles that we, we had available, and uh, the, altogether the, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, contain um, all the copies of the Scripture, some have several copies, all the Scriptures except the book of Esther. And so we have them in the Hebrew as they would have been at the time of Jesus. And of course the, 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 the Hebrew Scriptures from the Dead Sea have proved that the scriptures have been faithfully copied over the years and uh, you know what we have in our Bibles today is what was originally written. Of course we have them translated in, into different um, languages and of course our language is, is English and so we think about how the, how the Bible came to us in English. As we uh, see the, uh, the various Bibles, and as I've got together a collection of Bibles, we have the, the Hebrew ones there, we've got some Bibles from the Society for Distributing the Hebrew Scriptures, I have copies of uh, uh, the New Testament in Greek, of course what we call the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, New Testament in Greek, and uh, the, Jesus and his disciples would have spoken in Aramaic, which is a, a sort of um, uh, colloquial form of, of Hebrew. Uh, Jesus would have read from the actual Hebrew scriptures in the, in the synagogue. And um, I believe that uh, it was a, a wonderful uh, provision of God that when the New Testament came to be written, uh, it was written in Greek. Now, some people think, oh, well, you know, it was originally written in, in Aramaic, but I, I feel that uh, it was spoken in Aramaic, and then when it came to be collated and, and written down, um, it was written in Greek. And the reason I believe God allowed that was because that was the widest language um, uh, throughout the world, just as English is perhaps today. And also, um, uh, it's a very precise language. There are usually about three Greek words for every English word and it allows uh, you know, the meaning of the New Testament to be accurately translated. 
Now, as we, we think about these things and as we remember that the Bible was originally in Hebrew and Greek, we remember that in the up to the sort of 1500s, uh, the language that was uh, put forward was the Latin. Uh, because the Roman Catholic Church wanted to have, um, uh, you know, control of, of God's word, um, the most freely available Bible was that in Latin. But there were some who believed it should be in English. And the first one was, was a person called John Wycliffe. Um, he's remembered as the morning star of the Reformation. And uh, he produced uh, a Bible in English in 1382. And this was a, a translation from the Latin Vulgate into Middle English. And so it was really a translation of a translation. It also, of course, had to be copied by hand. It was a slow process. We have a, a copy of uh, John Wycliffe's Bible on the stand here. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's good to, to see that and to see that, um, uh, you know, at least somebody was wanting to, to get the, the Bible into the language of ordinary people. The next really big event to happen was the invention of the printing press that used movable type. Johann Gutenberg um, from Mainz in Germany invented the first printing press with movable type and in 1455 produced the first complete book, the Bible in Latin. Next on the scene is William Tyndale, and he was born in 1484. He was determined to give the English people a Bible printed in their own language. And so he set out to translate the scriptures uh, into English from the original Hebrew and Greek. He had to go to the continent to avoid arrest. And uh, his first New Testament printed in English was in 1526. So I have a, a facsimile of that here. And um, it's not, um, not an original. Um, in fact... Uh, there was one uh, Bible uh, from Bristol Bible College, and this is actually a, a facsimile of that, um, that was uh, sold um, to the British Museum for one million pounds just a few years ago. Uh, and um, uh, anyway, William Tyndale um, suffered much harassment, and, uh, uh, but he continued to translate the scriptures. And he translated uh, the New Testament all the way through. Finally, he was betrayed and arrested in Antwerp in 1535. He was then strangled and burnt at the stake in 1536. Now he's famous for two things that he said uh, being appalled at the ignorance of the clergy at that time, he declared, if God spare my life ere many years pass, I will cause a boy that driveth the plough to know more of the scriptures than thou dost. That's what he said uh, to, uh, to those who purported to be um, ministers of the gospel. Just before he was executed, he prayed, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Well now, did, um, did God answer those prayers? Well, he did because a friend of um, William Tyndale, Miles Coverdale, was asked by King Henry VIII to uh, make a, a translation of the scriptures from the original tongues and to place uh, a large copy 
of uh, the Bible in English in every parish church in England. Well, Miles Coverdale set about this work and although he didn't let on to King Henry VIII, he actually used the vast majority of Tyndale's translation of the New Testament. And then with his own uh, additions and um, using other people's translations of the, the Old Testament, he produced a Bible in English. Now, it has three names. First of all, the Great Bible, because it was a large size. And then it's called the, the Chained Bible, uh, because it was, um, it was so valuable uh, that uh, every copy had to be chained to the pulpit, or lectern. And thirdly, the third name is the Treacle Bible. Now, it was really uh, a version of the, um, here we are, the Geneva Bible, uh, but it was especially uh, produced for, um, uh, for England. Now, um, some time ago, I think it was about 1999, um, I attended an exhibition uh, put on by the uh, um, day one and uh, they wanted to show in schools and church halls and so on throughout the land um, the story of the English Bible and also uh, to show uh, famous people uh, in England who had been affected by the scriptures. And they, they put on this, uh, this uh, display and um, I went to see it and I, I was at that time uh, formulating my own Bible exhibition. And on show they had a, a chained Bible. I don't think it was a genuine one, but it was, it was one that they'd made up and it was on a lectern, it had a chain and a padlock. And I thought, oh, I'd really like to have a Bible like that uh, for my own exhibition. And so I, I sort of just committed it to the Lord, just prayed about it, and I, I just left it with the Lord. I started my, my Bible exhibition in, in 2001 and, um, you know, began to build up more and more exhibits and uh, particularly thinking about the, uh, how we got the Bible. And... Um, I also led a men's tour to Israel in 2001 and one of the, the men uh, that came with me to Jerusalem and to Israel was a man called John Foster and uh, he was a member of our church and his daughter worked for, as it was then, London Bible College. She actually worked in the, in the catering department and apparently uh, sometime before... Um, they'd had an auction to raise money for the college. And she'd uh, put in a bid for a Bible, it's an old Bible, and she thought, oh, my dad will be interested in that. So she, she made a bid of £50. And she got the Bible. And, uh, you know, I don't think really they could have looked at it that closely because uh, uh, John... Uh, came to me one day after we'd been to Israel. He'd been so blessed by it. His, his father was Jewish and uh, he'd always wanted to go to Israel. And we did have a wonderful time. The Lord blessed it. And anyway, he came in one day. I can see him now beaming all over his face and he had this Bible under his arm. Uh, and this is the Bible here. And um, uh, he said, oh, he told me the story of how his his uh, daughter's, uh, his daughter got it and he said, um, you know, I'd, I'd like you to have it for your exhibition, you can have it on permanent loan. Now he wasn't quite sure what it was, he didn't really know what, what but he knew it was an old Bible, he knew there was something about it. So first thing, uh, we took it, I took it, went with him to, to, um, uh, to see my friend Tristan MacDonald, um, who lives at Shoreham in Sussex, 
and um, uh, he opened it. He, he's got, got a large collection of Bibles, very knowledgeable about the, the history of the Bible, and he started me off on my exhibition. And um, uh, he, he opened the Bible and he said, oh yes, this is a treacle Bible. Now I'd never heard of a treacle Bible, I, you know, I, no one, uh, John had never heard of a trickle Bible, though obviously he knew it was something special. And he said, yes, he said, if you look in, uh, in, in Jeremiah and uh, chapter 8 and verse 22, uh, you'll see there uh, that um, it says, instead of, the translation is, um, instead of, is there no balm in Gilead, uh, Jeremiah is translated as is there no treacle in Old English, or is there no treacle in Gilead? And so it's, uh, it's known as the treacle Bible. Well, I was able to take that around in my exhibition, and uh, you know, when I said I've got a treacle Bible, everybody thinks I've got a Bible made of treacle, but it's, uh, uh, you know, um, it's uh, uh, quite, a, quite a thing, really. And... Um, Later on, uh, when uh, I, I moved from um, Carpenters, pastoring the Carpenters Park Church in, in Hertfordshire uh, to pastoring um, Rossmore uh, Gospel Church in Poole in Dorset, um, we, we had a mission with about 12 uh, church, local churches joining together and uh, that was uh, run by, we were invited to, to, to lead the mission uh, people from Wycliffe Hall uh, in Oxford. We had students there. And um, the person uh, in charge uh, of the, the group of students was the um, uh, principal, uh, Dr. David Wenham, a well known Bible scholar. And um, uh, I had my, my treacle Bible on show. And uh, he was just looking around the exhibition. It was next to the, uh, the scroll that we'd previously obtained in, uh, from a, a, a scribe in, um, in Jerusalem. And I thought that was the most valuable thing we had. But no, he said, he looked at this and his jaw dropped and he said, um, where did you get that from? So I told him the story of London Bible College. And um, well, he was absolutely amazed. And he said, you must put it in a, a showcase. He said, don't ever leave it out. He said, it's, it's, it's really, really valuable. He said, it's, it's absolutely, you know, priceless. So, um, so I thought, okay then. So we've got a, 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 a case for it. And I have usually have it, if, I'm, if it's just on show in the exhibition, uh, locked in a case and we try and make sure uh, that nobody can, can steal it. And uh, so we have that. In, so that's the, the Treacle Bible. But then later on, I was doing an exhibition at uh, Westminster Central Hall during August. And we were there for a couple of weeks during August. And um, obviously that's just, just across the way from, from Westminster Abbey. And um, there was on at the same time in, in Westminster Abbey um, some sort of conference of Bible scholars. Anyway, I remember one morning I was there and we were just going to do a talk, I think, probably about the uh, Jewish brides, I think, we're doing. And uh, this clergyman came in and he introduced himself as the, uh, uh, the Reverend um, Geoffrey Roper. And he said, um, he told me that he was, he was uh, at this conference uh, at Westminster Abbey. And he said, oh, he said, could, could I just have a look at your treacle Bible? It was in the you know, case that we, we now keep it in. And I said, yes, certainly. So I you know, didn't think much about it. So I, I, I took it out of the case and said, could I just look at it? So he looked at it and obviously it was open at the page uh, in Jeremiah there. And he, he, he sort of leafed through it and he said, ah oh, yes, well of course it is a, a treacle Bible uh, and it's, you know, the, 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 the translation is the Geneva Bible. But, you know, did you know, I think this is actually a, a great Bible. Now, I thought the, the Treacle Bible, that was published in, I think, um, uh, 1568, I think it was. But the Great Bible was actually published in 1539. And um, he, he, uh, uh, he said, well, you can tell, he said, 
by the, the Psalms. He said, if you look in the Psalms, you'll find there um, that the headings uh, tie up with the prayer book, with the Anglican prayer book, with Cranmer's uh, prayer book. And he looked all through, he said, oh yes, yes, this, 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 this does, yeah, that's right, yes, this is a great Bible. So, <laughs> so I must admit that was a bit of a shock to me. And also, of course, that's what's you know, called the chain Bible. And, um, and I remembered, well, it took, it took a little while actually for the penny to drop, but I, I remembered all those years before I'd prayed uh, for uh, a chain Bible. Uh, you know, I thought I might be able to get hold of a, maybe a replica or something, you know, and uh, I thought, well, I could use a family Bible, you know, and put a chain on it, which I think I did for, for a while. But, I, you know, I prayed about this and the Lord supplied. Now, we know that uh, the Lord answered William Tyndale's prayer and I believe he answered my prayer. Does the Lord answer prayer? He does. I can... I can tell you from experience, God answers prayer. And he does it in a marvellous way. Now, uh, a little later on, we, 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 we had done the, the, uh, the exhibition at um, uh, uh, the Westminster Central Hall. Uh, at the, when we started off at the, uh, my next pastorate at Thatcham Free Church in Berkshire. And... Um, uh, we, uh, we had a lady in the congregation who was the widow of one of the former pastors of the church. And uh, she told us that uh, her husband, uh, Roy, uh, had had, um, he, he, he had uh, what's known as a breacher's Bible. Now, I knew all about the breacher's Bible because um, uh, when I visited uh, Guildford Cathedral many years before, when I was... Uh, a boy, a boy. Um, they had a breacher's Bible on show in a showcase. You know, because it, it was a new sort of um, cathedral, they didn't have very many very ancient artefacts, but somebody had given them this, this breacher's Bible and it was open in the showcase and it had pride of place in the sort of exhibition items. And so I, I did know of the breacher's Bible. Anyway, I asked if I could look at it and, and we were allowed to, to keep it for a while and um, I've had that on show. Now, I have a facsimile of that Bible, and it's called uh, a Breacher's Bible uh, because um, it, it says instead of uh, aprons in, in um, uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, it says that they wore breeches. Also, uh, when I was showing uh, Tristan MacDonald what this was, he said, oh, yes, it's, this is actually a crate tradition. And in Luke chapter 2 and verse 7, it says instead of manger, it gives the old English word of crate. Now, it's not an authorised version. I thought it was an AV, but it's not, or King James Version. It's actually, um, again, it's a, uh, a Geneva Bible and um, it has these two translations, breaches, and Crouch. And so, um, as I've sought to uh, build up my collection of Bibles to show people and to introduce them to how we got the Bible, um, I can show them the scroll that we got from, from uh, Jerusalem. I can show them the, the Great Bible or the Treacle Bible um, uh, or, the, or the Geneva Bible. And also, I can show people this facsimile that I've got now of the, um, of the, the, the Breaches Bible. Now, I've got one other Bible which I managed to obtain, of, obtain which is uh, uh, fairly valuable. There are more available than there are of the Great Bible uh, because when I did a, an exhibition at the uh, United Reformed Church at Windsor, um, one of the elders there had, had one of these Bibles. It's a New Testament and... Um, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it speaks of Queen Anne. And um, uh, there's a note in the front, someone's written in pencil, uh, probably Queen Anne 
who came uh, to the throne in 1707. Certainly not Queen Victoria. So it's called, uh, you know, the Queen Anne New Testament. So we have these Bibles from uh, the 1500s, from the 1600s, and from the 1700s. And then I have uh, several Bibles from the 1800s, 1900s, and uh, right up until the year uh, 2000. And as we uh, see all these Bibles here, um, I hope you'll realise that, you know, it's really not a lot of use to us if we have Bibles just that we keep at home or, you know, are just left on the shelf. What we need to do is to read and to study the Scriptures. And as we do so, God will speak to us. Now, some people have a great facility for language. Some people learn Hebrew. Some people learn uh, Greek. I'm afraid um, my limitations are English, which, as you can hear, I don't speak that well anyway. But, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's wonderful to think that we have provided for us, at great personal cost, uh, the scriptures which we can turn to and read every day. Thank you. Hello. We're going to look now at what we call Curious Bibles for Collectors. And uh, those who have an interest in the scriptures are sometimes interested in collecting uh, various editions of the Bible in which there have been some mistakes, usually by, by the printers. Now, we all know that the, the Bible has been very carefully copied. But it's right that in, sometimes uh, mistakes do creep in. And that's why Bibles, printed Bibles, are always very carefully checked. And in days gone by, um, the printer uh, of a Bible who made a mistake could be fined vast sums of money. And that is certainly true of the Wicked Bible of 1631. Now, I have seen a copy of the Wicked Bible. Um, it's in the library of York Minster. And uh, my wife Sally and myself went up there. We were on a holiday there. And uh, we'd heard about the Wicked Bible. And someone told us, one of the guides, we were doing a, a, a city tour, uh, told us that they have the, the Wicked Bible um, at the, at the um, library in York Minster. So we went there. We made an appointment to have a look at it. It was got out of the safe for us and uh, it, but the, the curator was looking over us as we were looking at it. I did ask if I could photocopy the page, but he wouldn't have anything of it. But I have made up a facsimile of the Wicked Bible and uh, the printer was actually fined £300 for admitting, uh, omitting the word not from the seventh commandment. And so uh, in both places where the seventh commandment is listed in the Old Testament, in the um, uh, Torah, um, it says, thou shalt commit adultery. Uh, no wonder they keep it locked in the safe in York. The other Bibles that are, are interesting are the Placemakers Bible of 1562. And this um, uh, reads... In Matthew 5 and verse 9, blessed are the placemakers instead of peacemakers. And then there's the, the Bug Bible of 1551, where it says, Thou shalt not be afraid of the buggies, it says, or bogies by night, uh, instead of the usual translation, instead of terror, which is Psalm 91 and verse 5. We've already mentioned the Treacle Bible, um, the Geneva Bible, of, uh, which uh, speaks in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 22 of is there no treacle instead of balm in Gilead. And then the Unrighteous Bible, uh, which uh, says, Know ye not uh, that the, the unrighteous shall inherit, not, uh, instead of not inherit, the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. 
And then there's the Breaches Bible, which we've, we've mentioned, and uh, that says they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves breeches instead of aprons in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. And then there's what's known as the He and She Bibles. Between 1611 and 1614, there are two distinct editions of uh, uh, Bibles uh, known as the He and She Bibles from their respective readings in Ruth chapter 3 and verse 15. He or she went into the city. And then there's the murderer's Bible of 1801 and it says these are murderers instead of murmurers in Jude uh, 16. And then there is the Ears to Ears Bible of 1810, which has, He that hath ears to ear, let him hear. And that we find that in Matthew 11 and verse 15. And then there's the well-known Vinegar Bible of 1717, uh, where it says the parable of the vinegar instead of the vineyard, appears in the, the head, headline above Luke chapter 20. And all these we have uh, facsimiles of. And then there is another version of the murderer's Bible, an, an earlier one in, from 1795, which was printed by Thomas Bensley. And Mark 7 and verse 27 reads, Let the children first be killed instead of filled. And so you'll see with these sort of uh, mistakes uh, how easy it is to just to get something wrong. But as I say, we know that Bibles are very carefully checked. Now I'd like to show you two Bibles that I have. They're fairly recent. The first is the Personal Workers' Testament. And um, this was produced uh, to um, enable uh, those who wanted to share the scriptures with others uh, to have a, a New Testament uh, that was handy pocket sized and also had various key verses uh, underlined. And this is called the Elastic Band Bible because in Acts uh, 27 and verse... Uh, 40, we read these words. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rubber bands instead of rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made towards shore. So that's the elastic band Bible. Now, one Bible which I I always find quite amusing and which we usually mention uh, before Sally does the talk about the lady at Samaria, the, the woman at the well. This Bible is the illustration by Annie Voloton uh, for John chapter 4 and it shows the Samaritan woman coming to Jesus. She's carrying her water jar on her shoulder. There is Jesus sitting by the well and here is a bucket. Now, nothing unusual about that, you might say, except that in chapter 4 and verse 11, the actual text says, Sir, the woman said, you haven't got a bucket and the well is deep. Well, I suppose people must have uh, complained about that because uh, on the next edition, uh, they tipexed out the bucket. And so uh, the bucket is not there in the second edition. If you look through these good new Bibles and uh, if you can find a bucket Bible, it's quite rare and uh, I'd hang on to it if I were you. And so we see in all these uh, Bibles, uh, you know, various things that, uh, uh, you know, where mistakes were made. Well, of course, we're fallible but God's word is infallible. And uh, as we go back to the original and as we check over our scriptures, so we know that God's word can be trusted and the way of salvation 
is clearly marked for us in the scriptures. Now this uh, talk is entitled My Life with the Bible and uh, I'd like just to share with you for a few moments uh, how the Bible has helped me and the various times in my life when the scriptures uh, have been used by the Lord to bless me. When I was uh, growing up uh, at home, um, I started off in the, in the Anglican church. My mother, um, was, though not a regular church girl, was keen that I and my brother went to a local uh, Anglican church the, where she had uh, um, worshipped. And um, we were sent along to the, the Sunday school there. Uh, but either my brother or myself, we can't remember which, lost our, the caps that we bought for, ready to start school with. And she went back on her bike to the church, couldn't find it, and so she thought we were a bit young. And um, later on, we were sent to the, uh, the Methodist Sunday School by mistake because uh, a neighbour, a boy called Kenny Ledger, she knew that he went to Sunday School. She sent us along with him, but she hadn't realised that he'd been chucked out for bad behaviour at the Anglican Sunday School. And so uh, I started uh, at the Methodist Sunday School. And eventually I became a local preacher in the Methodist Church and uh, then, you know, became involved in mission work. Well, um, you know, so you can tell I have a very strong theological reason for belonging to the Methodist Church. Uh, at home, we had uh, three Bibles, really. One uh, was this family Bible, which was kept in a, a cupboard, and uh, this was from my, my grandfather's family, my mother's uh, father's family. And um, they were uh, from uh, Ickenham in Middlesex. And uh, my, my great-grandfather was the Sunday school superintendent at a little uh, congregational tin tabernacle in that place. Uh, my my great-grandmother was the chapel keeper and um, my mother, when she used to visit her, her uh, grandparents, uh, she would um, play the harmonium in the, in the chapel. And uh, so they had the family Bible, and this has uh, all the various members of the, the family in. And um, uh, one interesting um, entry there is of uh, my great uncle, uh, Herbert Bunce, who joined up in the First World War. He, he went into the, the army. He joined up at the same time as my grandfather, although he was a few years uh, younger, quite a few years younger. And uh, he eventually was sent to the Middle East. He was killed, I said, died with honour um, in Egypt. And I just thought, oh, well, he died in Egypt. That was it, you know, in 1917. But uh, later on, uh, members of the family checked up and they found that he's actually buried in, I think it's Khan Yunis, which is the, uh, the uh, Commonwealth Graves Cemetery, um, uh, which uh, has buried in it uh, the Commonwealth um, soldiers who died uh, around um, uh, that area as they were going up to um, Jerusalem and Jerusalem was taken in, in, uh, on the 10th of December, uh, 1917. And um, uh, it was before that time in October that my uh, great uh, uncle was killed. So, you know, he, he did take part in a very historic um, uh, sequence of events. The next one was a, a Bible um, of my mother's, just an ordinary little black Bible, and uh, it said uh, that it was uh, given to my mother um, uh, by her father in 1929. But there was another little Bible, and this is a, a New Testament, and it's actually an army New Testament, and um, it, there's a date in it um, from 1917, and uh, it's actually um, a Christmas present, uh, from my grandfather to my mother. And um, now, my, bearing in mind, my, father, my grandfather went through the, the First World War in France. He was four years in France. And um, he knew all the sort of dodges. 
and one of the things was to get hold of these, these uh, New Testaments and uh, to send them to members of your family. And so he was able to do that. But I always uh, loved looking at this. It's got uh, various uh, pictures, coloured pictures in here. Um, it's actually produced by the, for the church army, but it's the same um, sort of edition that you get from the Scripture Gift Mission. And uh, there's one picture here of the water carrier, and um, I've used that in my own exhibition to uh, speak about the, the water carriers that you would find at the city gate. So there were the Bibles that I had at home, not, not that great a choice really. And um, another Bible um, I was presented with was a New Testament um, on the occasion of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. And um, uh, this was uh, um, given to me by the, the school. In fact, it was 1953, I think. And uh, it's marked on here. And um, uh, I just started school. I was five years old. And with my, my brother, we, we, were, um, we had a photograph taken, a special coronation photograph. We had a, a five shilling piece we were presented with. Um, we had, um, uh, and, and these little uh, New Testaments. And I remember thinking at the time, oh, this is all right, you know, coming to school, you get free photographs, free <laughs> a free a present of, a, of, a, of a, a silver coin and these little Bibles. But this again, that's got um, pi nice coloured pictures in and uh, I have read, read that several times. So that's really the, the Bibles that I had as I was growing up. And then I, I started, uh, uh, well, I left school, first of all. And uh, when I left school, so I got that little New Testament when I started school. When I left school, I was presented with this Bible. Um, the headmaster, Mr. F.W. Goodger, signed it um, from February 1962, just before I left, left school in 1963. And... Um, it's an, an authorised version, King James Version, and it's published by the Bible Society, and it has plenty of illustrations. But as I, I mentioned before, for the uh, passages which they think are perhaps less popular, like uh, they think the, you know, the book of Leviticus, uh, they're in very small type. But nevertheless, it's got lovely illustrations, and uh, I've read that uh, often. Then um, I had a another New Testament when I left the, the Methodist Sunday School. And there's a nice sticker in there. It's a David Crowther. Um, it's uh, September 1962 on leaving the senior department of the Sunday School. And this is uh, the New Testament English Bible. Oh, sorry, the New English Bible in New Testament form. And um, uh, I was very pleased to be presented with it. And, uh, you know, I just sort of uh, I didn't really read it much at first. I had, while I was in the, the Sunday school, um, I was uh, asked by a, a, a Sunday school teacher, Colin Tunbridge, um, if you know, I'd ever thought of becoming a Christian. And uh, he had these decision forms and uh, you, you just uh, signed uh, the form saying, uh, giving the date, and saying, you know, writing your name, and saying that you'd enrolled as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I, you know, I, that was a start, and I look upon that as my conversion. Uh, but we weren't given any more information, really, and, and anyway, but I kept on going to Sunday school, uh, kept on going to the, the youth fellowship and so on, and uh, continued in the church. Uh, later on, in 1966, it was a Billy Graham crusade at Earl's Court. And as a member of the, the Youth Fellowship, um, and I'd started work in London at this time in uh, Gamages of Holborn. And um, uh, so my brother and myself went along on uh, one Thursday evening uh, to Earl's Court. Um, the people from, from our church had gone in a coach We'd got our train tickets, so we, we were able to, to join them afterwards. But it was during that service, we were only in the overflow hall, it was a youth service, 
And um, I remember particularly that when uh, Billy Graham made his appeal at the end of the service, um, it was just as if, it seemed to me anyway, it was like sort of waves of sort of, well, I can only describe it as, it was like sort of waves of light going over the congregation. Uh, certainly, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it really touched me and I, I, I felt that I should go, uh, I should walk down to the front, uh, you know, at the appeal, which I did. And, um, you know, I could no more remain seated in my chair and then I could fly. I just felt compelled to get up out of the seat and to go forward. Well, my brother went as well, and um, uh, we were counselled by a young man, went through the scriptures of salvation, and I thought, well, I, I am a churchgoer, you know. I've been going to, to Sunday school, and, you know, all through sort of youth fellowship and so on. And, um, but I felt it was useful. I felt really that was my first public commitment as a believer. And then uh, later on, um, I felt a definite call of the Lord uh, to become a, a local preacher. Now, with the, all that was going on with the Billy Graham crusade, and it just shows you how, how much difference uh, prayer makes because there were so many people praying for our land at that time. Um, I felt that I should read through uh, the New Testament now, I'd got this copy of the New English Bible, so I read it through from cover to cover and I found some amazing things in there. First of all, I, I remember a reading uh, there in Matthew chapter 24 where Jesus speaks about the abomination of desolation. And uh, that uh, decided me that, you know, there was a future. Something was going to happen in the future. Uh, I remember reading around that, that passage and it, you know, it's clear that Jesus was going to return again. Of course, we don't know when, no one knows the day or the hour. But I also discovered from that, just through reading it myself, uh, that uh, there would be a temple uh, rebuilt in Jerusalem. And I never really uh, doubted that since. And then, uh, as, I, as I read through, I came to 1 Corinthians and, uh, the, of course, the Acts of the Apostles before that. And as I read there, I, I read of how the early Christians behaved. I read there, really for the first time, about uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I thought, well, I've never seen anything like that in my church. And, um, uh, you know, I, I read all about the gifts of the Spirit and I thought, well, you know, people in those days, they seem to uh, speak in tongues. And I thought, well, that's very interesting, you know. And I, again, I never really doubted uh, about that, um, uh, you know, from then on. But then as I, I became a preacher and started my studies in preaching, I began to, that was in 1972, I began to hear about a move of God through all Christian denominations, uh, which was called the charismatic movement. And again, as I heard about it, I realised that it tied up with what I'd read in the New Testament. And so I never really had any doubt about it. And I'd also read um, from books that I'd got hold of at various um, uh, services that I'd been to where books had been on sale. I'd read about the... Um, uh, the uh, evangelical revival under John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, and how the Lord had really moved upon people uh, in this country at that time. And I read about how people had been actually, you know, under the, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit had moved in power and there'd been great revival. And of course, all this tied up with what was going on in the charismatic movement. And also, um, I, I read a, a little book about a, a preacher from Cornwall called Billy Bray. And um, I remember reading of his simple faith. And one story I remember in particular was that one day there's an account of how 
uh, Billy Bray was walking along uh, the road on, to one of his preaching appointments, I think, and he was go, walking with the man, and the man later testified that he could see Billy's lips moving as he was walking along. And he said, what are you, what are you praying about? And he said, well, you know, bless my soul. <laughs> he said, I'm praying for you, brother, and I'm praying that the Lord will pour down a uh, hundred tons of blessing upon you. And the man's testimony was, as he was walking about, he just felt the glory of the Lord coming upon him and uh, really filling him with the Holy Spirit. And I thought, well, of course, that's it, really, just a simple faith. But if you believe that God will bless you, then he will. And uh, I can tell you that I've uh, tried that prayer out several times on people. It's never failed. <clears throat> and also, God has blessed me. And uh, many times I've felt the Lord's anointing and blessing and filling and overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Well, um, as I was a, a preacher, I was led to, to uh, start a... Um, we used to meet for revival on a, a Friday evening with people of our, our own sort of age, little group of people, of boys our own age, and uh, young men. And um, we eventually started a mission team and uh, we used to go out under the auspices of, uh, auspices of, of um, uh, Scripture Union and various other, other organisations. And um, the Lord just opened the door to take uh, missions in villages and small towns uh, around the country. And I remember thinking about this and thinking, well, you know, um, uh, uh, can I really believe the scriptures? You know, we read these things in the, in, in, in the Acts of the Apostles and, you know, how were the scriptures really brought into being? Are they the same now as they were all those years ago? And then uh, I remember reading uh, something that Selwyn Hughes had written about um, Billy Graham and how on one occasion uh, Billy Graham was a little bit doubtful about the scriptures and he was about to in engage on a, a, a big uh, crusade, I think it was going to be in Los Angeles and um, he wasn't really sure, he had one or two doubts about the faithfulness of the scriptures and apparently one day he went into the woods just by himself he laid his open Bible on a tree stump. He knelt down and asked the Lord to make him certain uh, that uh, the Bible was true and could be trusted. And somehow, in some way, God spoke to him and made him sure. And, of course, that was the crusade that really took off. It was a, a wonderful crusade, really blessed of the Lord, and hundreds of people were saved. And that was the time also when uh, the newspaper magnet um, William Randolph Hearst um, uh, gave out instructions to all his newspapers uh, that they should, as he put it, puff Graham. Apparently one of his, um, uh, somebody who worked for him at his mansion had been to a Billy Graham crusade um, and when she got back she was completely changed. Her life had changed. And uh, because of that uh, happening, he decided that uh, Billy Graham should be uh, put forward and, and, you know, presented to the public. And so the Lord has a reason for everything, doesn't he, in our lives. And so as I, I saw that, I used to uh, preach, I, I used to think, well, I would, I would always uh, preach from a modern translation. And so I, I took hold of the, the New English Bible and that's what I used and uh, um, later on I went to the Good News Bible and now I use the NIV. But I, with my Bible collection, I've always tried to uh, look at all the scriptures to study the Hebrew and Greek. And uh, uh, let me tell you uh, that God can change your life through reading the scriptures. How can I be sure? Because he's changed my life.